Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants here, and welcome to episode 45 of Secret Sauce, the restaurant marketing podcast. Increasing your restaurant's profitability with lessons learned from the NRA show 2017. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success. Your secret sauce. Hey, hey, and yes, really excited to be podcasting from Chicago this week. We are halfway through, so it's late Sunday night, and we are halfway through the NRA show. And so I wanted to get this out before the end of the show. And what I wanted to do is go through some of the lessons that we've already learned from the NRA show. And I think it's a really big opportunity for restaurant owners to be getting out and to get a whole heap of value about ways that they can change their business. And I think back to uh, what Anna Ross said, you know, she started going to those trade shows to be exposed to what it was that other people were doing in the industry. And because the restaurant industry tends to be very uh, insular, this is a perfect opportunity for restaurant owners to get out and about and to see what's actually going on. We started off our trip to uh, Chicago with, um, I was lucky enough to go to a linear So, one of the top 50 restaurants in the world. I think it's the second best restaurant in the United States. Absolutely amazing. And we're actually going to do another, and it's the second time I've been to Alinea, and I'm going to do another podcast about it because Grant Ackatz out there has completely redesigned the dining room, redesigned the menu, a whole heap of new things, a whole heap of new lessons that I think that can be pulled out and put into, you know, virtually any sort of environment, the way that they structure the experience, the way that they structure the food, the kind of things that they do. There's a lot of lessons in there. So we'll probably do a separate podcast on that. So I won't rabbit on too much about that now. But what we do want to rabbit on about is what it is that you can get out of a show like the NRA show. So obviously, if you're not in the United States, it's a fair effort to get to get here and you know i know that just as well as anyone because it was a one hour flight for us from melbourne to sydney a 16 hour flight to dallas and from dallas it was however long it takes to get from dallas to chicago i'm pretty sure i slept through nearly all of it i was pretty tired by the end of it there's a lot of shows out there of course the nra show is the big daddy of them all I'm not sure what the figures are for this year. I think it's like 80,000 people. There are just truckloads of people. And it's interesting because tomorrow is going to be the big day because of being Monday. Tomorrow is going to be the big day. But there was a huge number of people there today and Saturday and a massive number of exhibitors. For me, it comes down to um, when you come to something like this, you obviously get to see the product that people are trying to sell. It's also about the people that you meet, the produce that's there, the procedures that people are working with. This is your big opportunity for professional development. It's the chance to take some time off from the restaurant to clear your head a little bit, particularly if, if, you know, if you're in Chicago, then you're just going to a trade show in Chicago. If you're coming from anywhere else, then you're actually going to have to, to go there. And I think that the process of going to a different place gives you a little bit of head time to be able to think about the restaurant and it gives you a little bit of distance from the physical location so that you can start thinking about the problems that you've got in the restaurant. And it's a good idea, I think, to have a list of questions that you've got when you come to a show like this so that you can be looking for answers. The thing that I do is you walk along and and you see every stall and you think, what does this person know? How could I learn something from them? And if you go with an attitude like that, I think that sort of sets you up to to really get the most value out of it. But the big thing is, so today we're halfway through the show and I have there's three massive halls plus the bar show. So the bar show's got all of the alcohol in it, which is, um, which is lots of fun. I've probably done half of it. So I'm not going to get to see everyone this year. It's just that huge. And I do spend a bit of time talking to people. So it's very interesting, sheer size of it and all of the th- people with all of the product that they've got. So the people, it's great to catch up with. Uh, I met up with uh, Eric Cacciatore from Restaurant Unstoppable, of course. And we had a good chat. We plan to uh, catch up a little bit later and have a few more beers and talk about podcasting. I've met people from 
secret source as well who've you know either recognized me or have arranged to meet there you know so Carl it was great to meet with you you know lots of other people that we've been talking to it was exciting meeting uh Phil Villapiano so Oakland's Raiders player from Super Bowl 11 uh, a little bit before my time but I'm a bit of a Raiders fan we don't get to see too much of the NFL in Australia so he works for a logistics company Win Logistics, which is a, an aggregator of, uh, it's a software platform for aggregating distribution, so you can cut distribution costs. Uh, now, at a restaurant show, you'd think that they wouldn't get a lot of interest. I tell you what, he had one of the longest queues, and I was in it because it was the opportunity to meet Phil, so quite a famous linebacker from back in the day, <laughs> and he was everyone in the line. He was uh, having his photo taken and assigned football, which I thought, wow. Isn't that a really interesting way of... He was the only guy who was sort of doing that sort of thing that I've seen so far in the show. And it worked for him because the queue was massive and people were really excited to be meeting with him. It's also... The other thing that I think is really interesting is the um, the ad hoc meetings that you have. So last night I went out for pizza. And I've got to tell you, it was quite actually a, a tortuous event. It took me about half an hour to decide where to go and I actually gave up and I was just thought, you know what, I'm just going to go for a wander and see what I can find. The, the issue was I wanted to get deep dish pizza, but looking at it, I thought there's no way that I could eat all of that and it's just going to go to waste because I don't have a fridge in the hotel room. So staying at the Congress Plaza, just um, FYI, I haven't seen any ghosts yet, which is super exciting. So what I was looking for, and because they, the smalls were like $25, and I thought if the pizza is $25, it's going to be massive. There's no way I'm going to be able to eat that by myself. So that actually put me off. And and I'd looked at multiple ones of the, you know, the typical, because I just wanted a standard Chicago deep dish pizza. And I'd given up on that plan. I thought I'll go and get something else. And I so like I look at restaurant websites all the time. I was actually, I was going through the thought process of what it was that I wanted. And, you know, this is where the descriptions of the menus are so important and understanding your customers because of the fact that none of them really looked like that they were catering for individuals. I decided to skip and get another cuisine. Now, and this is the thing that's completely bizarre about it. I was walking probably a couple of blocks from the hotel. I still hadn't found anything. It was about 9.30 on a Saturday night and there was a few places were already closed and I was starting to get a little bit worried. And I see a guy who is eating pizza and it's in a pizza box and it's a very small pizza box. And I'm thinking, wow, that's individual sized. Now, the great thing is he didn't have a generic pizza box. It had the name of the pizza restaurant on it. It was Giordano's and I thought, that's it, I'm going there. Had a look on Google Maps, 800 meters away, bang, I'm in. Which... I find it really interesting that I'm not sure if the others were catering for single people, single diners. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but no one clearly articulated that they were. So it was just by actually being able to see the end product and most particularly the the size of it. That was, you know, I knew exactly what it was that I wanted then and and I went there and I ended up not having a deep dish pizza. They had a... um, an Italian beef, kind of like a pie, which was really quite epic and really yummy and I thought wow why don't they have these in Australia and this is the kind of thing so uh, you know American cuisines you know really quite popular at the moment in in Australia these kind of pizzas no one is doing them now the other thing I thought was quite interesting about this was we have a lot of issues with Domino's you know they they'll do a pizza pickup for four ninety five. now their whole business is systematized very heavily because it's a large franchise one of the things that they don't do is anything like this it actually said on the menu it's going to take 20 minutes for our um, team of artisans to to produce this and I thought wow that would be really interesting if you produce this and said it was going to take 20 minutes I bet it'd be actually quite difficult for Domino's to replicate that because of the fact that everything else is is done on a different timeline so it might be a product that would actually get around their dominance and and it was a really nice I quite liked it the interesting thing was what's the best part about a pie it's often the crust they had heaps of that crust there so yeah a really good product now that's a long way of getting to the point of the people that you meet so I was actually sitting there eating my pizza and I was listening to the guys next to me and one of them runs a startup that does get uh, customer feedback for restaurants and the other guy was a CFO for a 
company that owns two fairly large size chains, so 200 restaurants in each of the chains. And so we got talking about the financial metrics trends within the restaurant industry and it was really interesting because you don't normally get to speak to people like that because we talked about you know one of the big trends is how you know Grubhub is taking all of this margin from restaurants and how it's economically unsustainable one of the things that we were talking about was so many restaurants and I know you know because our team enter a lot of restaurant menus so many restaurants will have the exact same takeaway menu as the dine-in menu there's no difference in price and there's no difference in the product that they've got, which is really interesting because some products don't travel well. And I know that this is one of the things that, that Uber Eats does is they'll actually sit down and work with the restaurants on the menu. But too many people aren't thinking that those guys who are still doing delivery themselves, none of them are actually thinking about the product that they're shipping. So you've got some products like a soup, which travels really, really well, as long as it's locked down and as long as it's not going to explode everywhere. A soup is a soup. It's not going to make really that much difference. You've got other product, however, which travels remarkably poorly. This is one of the things that restaurants aren't thinking about is how do they either, you know, cut the menu down that they're going to do delivery to things that deliver well or Or how do they start actually doing some menu engineering so that they can change their menu for delivery so that it is more robust when it is delivered? So that's one of the little things that you can think about. I actually had a chat to the guys from Grubhub and they said that they're charging between 15 and 25% if the restaurant's doing delivery and if Grubhub is doing the delivery. And I think they're in about 75 cities now where they're doing delivery. They're charging 25 to 35%. I reckon that the twenty five percent that's actually not too bad if Grubhub's doing the delivery thirty five percent that's get starting to get tr- quite troublesome. I couldn't believe that they're charging twenty five percent when the restaurant's doing the the delivery. That is madness, absolutely madness, and of course, you know they confirmed the fact that you know it was interesting the guy said, oh yeah it's in it's in our agreement with our customers that we can't give." their contact details to the restaurant. And I thought that summed up so much about their business strategy. They talk about their customers, not the restaurant's customers. It seems kind of trivial that you'd be able to give the email address from a restaurant that you've ordered, but they view them as Grubhub views the person who's ordered as their customer, not the restaurants. And that's what causes all of the issues. We'll continue on talking with the the CFO. It was really interesting to get that perspective. He goes and reviews his supplier contracts on a weekly basis to make sure that they're getting the best deal on all of the things that they're doing because some of the prices, you know, particularly things like seafood and meat, can fluctuate quite a bit. So they need to be reviewing their margins. This is one of those things that I think far too many small restaurants do on less than an annual basis which is very, very scary. And I've had multiple conversations with restaurants where they'll say, oh, we went to the accountant and we found out that we weren't making any money or that we, how, to find out how much money we're losing. You should know that and you should know it on a weekly basis. When you go to the accountant, he tells you how things are. That's all in the past and there's nothing, not one thing that you can do to influence that. You need to be looking at it and getting an understanding of what the numbers are and then moving forward with it. It was an interesting insight into some of the financial systems that some of the restaurants, the big restaurants are using that small restaurants aren't and need to be doing. There was quite a few businesses out there with coaching programs. I spoke to the guys from barandrestaurantcoach.com. Very strong program to help restaurants and bars to be able to systematize, stabilize, and scale their businesses. That's their little catchphrase. And I thought, wow, there's, there's certainly a lot of demand for that because people are just really struggling with the systematization. And this is one of the areas that we're going to be doing a lot more work on the podcast on how do you systematize the processes around your financials and making sure that you have got them under control, you know what they mean, and that you're able then to scale out the processes that you're doing. It was interesting. We actually ran a, um, a little marketing workshop as a bit of an experiment. So we had about 10 restaurants come into our office, and I just gave a, a two-hour presentation on well, it actually went on closer to three hours, actually, because we had a lot of discussion. And that was one of the things that I thought was really interesting. And I think there's probably some work that can be done in that area is what is the mechanism for restaurant owners to be able to get together? Because it was really interesting. People came in and so they were mingling around the food before we actually started. And 
everyone within about two or three minutes were discussing their restaurant quite really avidly and sharing, you know, fairly secret kind of information, things like, you know, their percentages of revenue for wages, rent, you know, how are they going? It was interesting because, you know, they were all, you know, relatively close to us. Some had come from the other side of the city, but so they actually knew each other's restaurants and were e- even then were still prepared to share some of their KPIs. This is one of the things that I think would be would create a lot of value for restaurants is, is talking to other restaurants and just, you know, going through it because everyone's got the same problems. That's the thing that I find amazing. Everyone's got the same problems, yet there's very little talking and a lot of restaurant owners don't talk to other restaurant owners because they're worried about, you know, they view them as the competition, which I think is actually really quite crazy. Everyone's got the same problems. Who's got the best solutions? Because the interesting thing is that the solution that you've got in HR might be better than everyone else's, but their solutions in marketing or, you know, cost controls might be better than yours. A little bit of sharing can go a really a long way. Some of the products that we saw, so firstly, there was a huge amount of food. And I think the thing that I find really interesting about this, and I put a po- picture up on Facebook yesterday of, of some alligator sausages. Now, I'm not from around these parts. And so alligator is quite novel to me. If I saw that on a menu in a dish that was halfway acceptable to what it was that I wanted to eat at the time, I'd probably eat it. You know, to me, that's exciting. I've, um, you know, I rarely get to have alligator. You don't have to be overly creative to tell a story about alligator, you know, alligator burgers, alligator uh, sausages, whatever it is. I think that that's a really good example of the story of the product that you have on the menu because a lot of the time, you know, it'll be fish and chips. Well, what kind of fish is it? How have you prepared it? What is it that you've done that's different? Now, it's interesting because I'm reading Charles Spencer's book at the moment and he talked about Patagonian toothfish. Now, in the 70s, someone came up with the idea of calling it Chilean sea bass because Chilean sea bass was viewed as a higher premium product than Patagonian toothfish. Now, it was interesting because, you know, you talk about the people that you meet. There was a guy from the Falklands Islands there selling Patagonian toothfish. Now, what he was saying is that, well, no, there is a difference between chili and sea bass. Because I went up to him and said, ah, you know, I thought I'd be clever and say, well, what's the difference between a Chilean sea bass and a Patagonian toothfish? Knowing full well the answer. Cause, and I said, aren't they the same fish? And he said, well, yes, but... Chilean sea bass comes from a lot shallower waters, and by shallow we're talking 300 metres, and it's caught in nets, so they tend to be a little bit uh, smaller. Now, Patagonian toothfish can live, or Chilean sea bass, can live to 50 years old. So, and the big ones can be 100 kilos, that's a big fish. These are caught long line. And they are caught from two kilometres down. And I think the water is also a bit more subtly, a bit closer towards Antarctica. So they have a higher fat content. So the, the whilst it is exactly the same animal, the fish st- tastes uh, quite a bit different. And so now all of a sudden you can start to... Like, that's a product that would I would have thought would sell quite well on a menu. And of course, you know, the menu, you know... Test and adjust, put it on the menu, put that description, you know, so we're going to have Patagonian toothfish. This Patagonian toothfish was captured from uh, 2,000 metres down close to the Antarctic shelf. Because of that, they've got a high oil content and they're very healthy for you and blah, 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 blah. And it's caught by, you know, John from the Falklands Islands. That sounds exciting. That sounds interesting. That's the kind of thing that I think would I would try that out, you know. And, you know, if you're worried, if you want to de-risk the proposition, what does it taste like? Man, it tastes a bit like salmon or it tastes a little bit like, I don't know, Probably it's probably close to salmon. How does that compare in regard to that? And this was a theme that was replicated time and time and time again. There were... You had the guys from Pepsi and from Coke, and they were quite happy to tell you about ways that you could increase the volumes that you were selling because, you know, that's in their best interest. But how many people sat down with them and, and spent 15 minutes? Because you got the smart guys there. You know, these guys have sold a lot of Coke and a lot of Pepsi in their time. 
how many restaurants sat down and said, you know, what can I do? You know, what is the best way to increase my volumes? It's a high margin product, I would have thought. You've got these really smart guys there to be able to come up with those answers on how to do that. Meat, there were a lot of meat producers. A lot of the state agricultural boards were represented. And, you know, they'd have like mini stands of, you know, and each one, you know, they had product from the area, whether it be meat, whether it be cheese, whether it be, you know, I saw lots of vegetables as well. You know, these are the kind of things that you can put, you know, if it's a state that's got a reputation for being clean, you know, we've got organically grown food from blah, we've got this, tell that story, have that story come out on the menu, because this is one of the big reasons that you can charge a higher margin, just in that description. So bringing that back to the Chilean sea bass, Charles Spencer found that you could charge more for Chilean sea bass than you could for Patagonian toothfish. Exact same fish. Now, obviously, now we know that there are some minor differences, but no one actually knew that back in 77 when this was done. But Chilean sea bass, a premium product, perceived to be a premium product, which could command a higher profit margin. So keep that in mind. And this is one of the things I think, you know, a lot of people, I was talking to a couple of restaurant owners and they were saying, oh, you know, there's there's so many people here, but, you know, we've got our suppliers. And it's like, really? You know, do you have the best meat supplier? Because, you know, either you've got someone who spent a lot of time on procurement or you're probably just lazy. Now, you know, it's good to be loyal and all of those sort of things, but, you know, you might just want to check prices just to make sure that you're not getting ripped off. You might just want to, you know, see if someone has got a better story. You might want to have a story with a producer and find out that they've got a great story and then go back to your producer and say, what's your story? Am I doing the best that I can do to tell your story? Because maybe I'm not. Maybe I don't even know it. Maybe we've been buying meat from you for 20 years and we've forgotten the story and you don't bother telling us because we've been buying the the meat for 20 years that's there could be margin in that story and i think you know far too many people miss that and as a consequence they then miss the margin which is sad on to some of the products that we saw you know there was lots of pos systems as there always was lots of online ordering systems once again you know some of them keep emails some of them share them with the restaurants some of them are quite expensive Nearly all of them were charging, you know. So it sort of beggars belief that, you know, Grubhub and and the other online ordering companies have still got a market when there's a lot of alternatives out there that, that are sharing the email with the restaurant. And then, of course, you know, <laughs> there's obviously our the free restaurant online ordering system, which had another um, – I had a brief look at the sales data today because uh, it's Sunday night here, Monday morning – in, well, it's at our Monday afternoon, but we get a, a data email every Monday and it looked like it was another record week for us, which is exciting. The growth is continuing. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. One of the big trends, which I think is, a, is fairly new, really starting to hit its straps in the industry is the Internet of Things. So having a chat to the guys at the Microsoft stand, they've got a coffee machine which integrates with the supplier of the coffee machine. So you can now get information how many cups of coffee were done with the coffee machine. When is it going to need servicing again? When is the door open? How much milk has gone through it? All of these sort of things are going to make it a lot easier for you to get an understanding of what's going on in your kitchen you'll be able to have metrics, you'll be able to track them. You know, does it correlate with your sales data? That would be interesting because then you're starting to work out how many coffees are being given away a day. How many coffees are being given away a day? That's a scary thought. But an item that has typically been, you know, a dumb item is now being, you know, given some smarts to be able to say, well, today we made 212 coffees. You then take that and you go and compare it with your POS data and find out you've been doing 178. Now you're starting to think about how much, you know, you've been thinking that your margin isn't as good on coffee as it should be. Ha ha, now maybe we've got an idea about why that is. There was one product there that I thought was really impressive. So a Naboo oven. The thing that was impressive about this is that you, over the internet, you load up things like recipes. So you can have the recipe in there. You can have a photo of what the dish is meant to look like. I was kind of thinking, oh, you know, I don't really think that you need that on a, on a bloody oven. You know, I'd probably want to get that information off a, off a tablet or something. But 
what you couldn't do with that, and the, de- the demonstration was they had a series of dishes prepared, ready to go in, and as they were doing the presentation, they started to, to put them in. And what they would do is so they would put the scallops on a tray and then they'd put it in the oven, which had been preheated, and all they did was they grabbed the menu for the scallops and put it on the second tray. There's a little graphical interface on the front of it. So they just sort of like with their finger, just move that down onto the second tray. And the oven knew that the scallops need seven minutes. And so a little timer went down. And then, you know, 60 seconds later, they put the croque monsieur in. Now, how long does that take? Because they just moved the recipe down onto that level. And so they ended up with, I think, six or seven dishes in the oven, all with individual times, all being controlled by the oven and I thought wow that's actually pretty sweet because now you've got an ability to get better utilization out of your oven and I don't know never been in a kitchen but how many times has someone taken out something too early and served it up or too late and burnt it so this is going to save money get better utilization of the oven and produce a more consistent product for your customers. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And all through a internet-enabled oven, which, you know, on the face of it, you go, oh, God, that's the last thing we need is another internet-enabled device. Because, you know, of course, we all know the bit of the fiasco that came out when the, the first one was the fridge, and that was meant to, you know, go out to Amazon and buy milk from them whenever you needed milk. I don't really think that that was a pro- that wasn't right. It wasn't the right product for this. But seeing that oven, I was like, wow, that's actually pretty cool. And I reckon you'd be struggling not to be more efficient with a product like that. You know, getting items out of the kitchen quicker. You know, just think about all of the follow-on effects. I'm just thinking about them now. But And so they had, I'm pretty sure they had six or seven items in, in that oven at once. If you're cooking that, your throughput in the kitchen is going to be faster because you're not having bottlenecks, which is good. The great bit, though, is that you're going to be decreasing the amount of time that someone's in the restaurant. So if you want to increase your turns, you know, the number of times that you'll have someone in a a seat each night, this would be one of those really cool ways of doing that. I spent probably a couple of hours in the bar show today, and I saw some things that really sort of stood out. There was a lot of brands, and, you know, it's interesting, you know, going to the restaurants that I've been going to. You look at the beer menu. That was one of the criteria for last night's pizza. I wanted to have a couple of beers as well. And, you know, there was a few places that didn't have alcohol in there, so they sort of got ruled out. But with the beer list and your spirits and your wines, is there anything in there that to make it a little bit unusual? Because is there anything in there that can make it a little bit of an experience? There was a lot of products there, and I thought it was interesting because for some reason, you know, there tends to be a bit more marketing thought that goes behind beverages, you know, whether it's wine, whether it's spirits or beer, that there seems to be a, a lot more thought goes into the product. So there was one distillery there, and their big push was that you can do away with your imported spirits. So they make a gin, they make a vodka, they make a whole heap of spirits. So now all of your straight spirits, all of your cocktails, you can say that they're made with American spirits. That is a unique selling point. That's something that you could say, you know, you could have a big American flag across the bar and saying, we don't have any imported spirits here, you know, particularly if you've got a simple bar, you know, that would be not, you know, our cocktails, American made, that makes you unique. There was a lot of people in, with, uh, you know, botanicals, I tried a few things, uh, some of them were colourful, some of them not so much, there was a chili vodka, that was quite nice. These things are a little bit unusual, you know, the perfect ingredients for a signature cocktail, you know, something that you can, you know, if it looks half good, the kind of thing that you can throw up on Instagram, the kind of thing that you can put on Facebook, the kind of thing that you can run a Facebook ad to, all of these sort of things really help you to get that message out and to be a little bit unique. Now, a great example of a beer was a Yeti Imperial Stout. So this has got a picture of the Yeti on it. It's quite a big beer. I think it's like 9% or something. And it's got a picture of a big Yeti on the can. And 
you know, they had a whole marketing campaign behind it. They had stickers, you know, I believe, with the outline of the Yeti. So they're building that little cult following, and this was one of the most popular beers. They're building that popular following around their beer. Now, that's the beer that you want to have on your beer list. If you're only going to have one, you know, dark beer, you, you might run with that. This is the big one. Have a look at this, you know. A well-marketed product. And there was, look, there was plenty of them out there to be able to suit a wide range of genres and fields for restaurants. So it's a lot easier now to, rather than just to have your standard beers that you, that you would normally have, there's really the opportunity to have some beers that really fit tightly where, where their brand is going to fit in tightly with your brand. And I think that that's really important because that helps you to have a better brand experience. You know, if you're trying to say that you're completely unique and then you've got Bud, that's not really that unique. You're going to need unique beers. If And if you go to the effort of getting the unique beers, i tell you one thing I saw, which I thought was really epic. They had beer mugs that were made out of copper and a, a company called Barbarian Brands. And these look like they would be drunk by barbarians. And I said to the guy, you know, if you drank a beer out of that, you would feel like going and invading a Scandinavian country. It was just huge. And I think if you went and bought, you know, a few of those and, you know, people order some sort of beer and you bought it out in that, people would just go, wow. And I think that you've got really got the, the massive opportunity to create the kind of experience because this is the thing that you really want. You want it to be carried out to the table and people go, oh, What's that guy having? Oh, I'll, I'll have what he's having. You know, I'll have what he's having. This is the visual component of the product that you're generating that is going to increase the check size. You know, so many people don't think about this stuff, which I find really disappointing. But as soon as I saw that, and I think I was more excited in their product than they were, but I was like, man, this is epic because I can see that and people are just going to go, yes. You know, and it does two things because people are going to say it and say, I'll have what he's having. The other component of it is I'm going to come back to this place because I can drink from a mug like this. This is an epic mug. And they had a whole, they they actually had cooking gear. And I I said, wow, what would you use the cooking gear for? You'd have to bring this to the table because it would be a crime to have such a beautiful copper pan in the kitchen. And they had shot glasses as well. And I thought, you know, well, that's the perfect opportunity. Someone orders a round of shots, bring it out on these couple of things. The, the big thing was it was the, for me, was so the partially the look, uh, copper on the outside, silver lined on the inside, but the feel, it was very heavy. And it brings me back to the work of Charles Spencer, who does a lot of the psychological work behind food. And um, he's done quite a bit of work with Heston Blumenthal, and I'm plowing through his book at the moment. He talks about flatware, and the heavier it is, the more appreciated the meal is. So people rate the meal as being higher, in higher quality, when it's the exact same meal if they've used heavier knives and forks. Now, that's got to come across in drinks, because like... I wasn't even drinking and I was enjoying myself more. This is the kind of, you know, sort of that psychological play that you can start to be working on to be able to create that better experience. And I I think it's interesting because I talk to some people and they say, oh, you know, how are we going to create a better experience? And it's like, well, how about smiling? You know, how about getting your front of house staff to smile? You know, I'll, I'll give you a really good example. And this is the thing that I, you know, I always say that I'm sick and tired of seeing great restaurants being outmarketed by crappy restaurants. On the first night here, I'm not going to mention any names, but I went to a restaurant that was on my list from last time to go to. They do do quite a bit of marketing. They've got some pretty big statements there that they make about just how, you know, super exciting their restaurant is. And I thought, yep. And, and it's a typical Chicago kind of place. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm uh, it's my first night here. I'm going to go there. And I went in there and uh, I ordered their sign. I said, you know, what should I order? You know, what's what's popular here? And oh, you know, this is our signature dish. I was like, okay, hit me with that. And it came out and I was like, wow, this is presented really quite ordinarily. 
and it was okay. We're not talking, you know, best of anything here. It was okay. It was it was good, but I was kind of let down. The thing that made the experience even worse was I spent probably 30, 40 minutes in there, and I spent most of that time listening to the staff complaining about other staff members and watching the food come out. Where I was sitting, I could see all of the food come out, and then people would take a chip and then they'd go and serve it up to someone. And it's like, wow, amazing, amazing. And so when we talk about experience, so that's an experience from which I will not go back. You know, I'm pretty comfortable. You know, there's places that I love here that I haven't been to because I'm only here for a few days. Tragically, I'm only here for six days, I think it is. So I'm on a tight schedule and there's lots of places to eat. So, you know, Grand Lux Cafe, I won't get to go to Grand Lux Cafe this time round. I'll probably go next time, but I love that place. It's epic. Everything there, it's a great experience. Um, it, the interior is just magnificent and the food is is really, really good. Now, a lot of that is the experience. So, you know, they've got the decor, but it just comes down to the place that I went to, if the staff had been better motivated, if they'd been better trained, it would have been like, I think... Uh, it would have been a good experience. The food was good. I was a bit let down. I was expecting something a lot more exciting than good. I would have been happy with good. But then the whole experience just fell apart. So, you know, you get your staff, you know, think about your CRM system. What is there from a CRM point of view that you can do to make it a little bit more unique? So that's about it. I think that really everyone in a restaurant needs to think about getting out of the restaurant restaurant at some stage and talking to other restaurant owners, having a look at the produce that they've got, have a look at the things that they've got in the kitchen, their processes and their systems and look at ways that they can improve. We're not looking to improve anything by 10%. It's the one percenters that you're after. If you can get go from just your stock standard beef to you know a certain type of beef that's a little bit cheaper but it's got a little bit more interesting story, you know, it, can you go from something that you're getting from a mass supplier can you get it from a local butcher you know maybe at a better price what is there that you can do to make those little tiny changes that are going to make the restaurant a lot more profitable and successful before we head off though i I want to talk to one experience that i had and that was a pop-up restaurant uh, which has popped up last year so it's it's a fairly established pop-up uh, when I first heard that it was a pop-up, I was like, oh, look, is it a week or a month? No, this is. I think it's almost been coming up for a year. And that is uh, Saved by the Max. So it's a pop-up based on Saved by the Bell, the diner in the show. And look, this is my um, – I'd never actually seen the show, but I was invited there. And I thought, oh, yeah, look, it sounds interesting. I can just see what it is that they do to make this e- experience. As you walk in, there's some lockers, uh, some of them are open, there's a mobile phone in there from the 80s, which is just huge. The thing that was really interesting was I stood at the front waiting for oh, probably 20 minutes and each group that went by that locker saw the mobile phone, took it out and took a photo with it. Now, who knows how many of those are going to end up on social media, but I reckon quite a few because everyone was playing it up with the, the I'll, I'll put a photo in the in the notes but this was like a brick an absolute brick and people were taking this photo and they were hamming it up one guy did a video he's like hey it's me yep i got the new iphone 8 here yeah super excited look i'm going to send a text and he was like playing with it like he was sending a text message people were really getting into the whole experience of saved by the bell Um, They had some TVs up on the wall which were playing reruns of it. The whole decor was as close as possible to the replica of the Max, the actual diner in the show. There was graffiti around which was all, you know, sort of of show specific. And it was interesting because people were in the queue. People were like, oh, wow, you know, what's it going to be like? This is going to be so exciting. And, you know, they were reminiscing. The music was, you know, sort of 80s music. People were really excited to be there. And I was pleasantly surprised at just how excited people were to be at this this pop-up restaurant, the diner. So it was a Monday night. It wasn't full, but it was not far off it. It was it was almost full. There was only a few when we left there was only a few empty seats. And you know the interesting thing? We've talked about how excited people are and the, the things that they've done. We haven't even mentioned the food. 
haven't mentioned the food. This was about the experience, not about the food. And and the food we had a lobster roll, which was really nice, um, and the dessert was quite nice as well. They had a menu that had that was based around characters from the show, and they had a cocktail list that was based on you know characters from the show. And yeah, I had a cocktail, um, a whiskey based cocktail. It was really nice. I was quite happy with it. I didn't get the reference to the character, but I'd never seen the show, so you know, it wasn't kind of aimed at me. But I think that this is the really exciting thing. Now, obviously, they had to go and get licensing from the studio that owned the rights to saved by the bell but what an amazing concept and the fact that the, this pop-up has been around for so long i think that, you know you'd be looking to see more of this kind of stuff because they weren't selling food they were selling nostalgia you know the experience in it sort of writes itself so have a think about everything that we've said if you if you've never been to the nra show and you can make it i would definitely recommend heading along uh, it's probably going to be next year by the time you listen to this in 2018 it's my must-go-to event. There are ones in Australia, but they're just so much smaller than this. They've got education sessions. They've got a whole heap of things. And just from a product and menu engineering point of view, so many things, so many people that you can talk to. These are the experts in their products. And the knowledge that they had, you know, I had some really good, interesting conversations with people about the things that they were that they were selling. And you should too, you should be out there having those conversations and trying to work out how you can take the best parts of what they're doing and put, make that into uh, so that the, you've got better parts in your restaurant. Just remember, it's those little one percenters. So, and yeah, I'm not expecting for everyone to come up with a TV show from the 80s to create an experience around, but it'd be nice to see a couple of others, particularly it'd be nice to see some ones that I watched. So I'm probably waiting for the A-Team pop-up. That would be epic. I mean, you probably the door would probably be the like the side door to the you know the black van with the red racing stripe down the side. Just thinking about it and to go don't don't go spending a fortune on fit out on it. But it sounds like a pretty epic idea. And look, in all seriousness, based on the excitement with, that was in that room, I think this kind of thing has definitely got legs. Whether it's a movie, whether it's you know, there's a whole heap of things that you could do around this. So that's about it. So um, I hope you learned something from it. Get to a trade show. I think that's really important. Get to a trade show. Get out. Start talking to some other restaurant owners and you know, start using the information that you get in your products that you find to start increasing the profitability in your restaurant. So I'll leave it at that. You have an outstanding day. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com.